Welcome to the Oxfordshire Community Hub. We are pleased to have with us as our guest, the very Reverend Professor Martin Percy, Dean of Christ Church, University of Oxford. Martin, welcome to the Oxfordshire Community Hub and thank you so much for joining us. That's a pleasure, Manala. Really good to be with you and thank you for the invitation to join you for this uh, interview. Really good. Thank you. So t tell me, Martin, what is the role uh, of being a, a Dean of Christ Church and what might it entail? Thank you. Well, um, it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, question and on the face of it, I think uh, a very straightforward one. Uh, and I know this word is, is overused sometimes, uh, the word unique, but I am going to use this word in connection with the role of the Dean of Christ Church because um, you're uh, the head of house, uh, for uh, a fairly large Oxford college. Well, there's you know, more than 30 of them uh, knocking around in Oxford and a similar number in Cambridge. Um, but you're also the Dean of a cathedral, one of only uh, 45 um, in the Church of England. And so it's uh, a dual function. And in theory, my job is um, uh, a little bit in the cathedral and then the sub-dean sub doing a lot. Um, and then I have, on top of that, um, essentially uh, people to assist me on the college side as well. And then in addition to that, you've also got um, your responsibilities to the Diocese of Oxford, three counties, Oxfordshire, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, uh, the National Church, um, I'm an academic as well, so I write and I teach a little bit, as much as they let me, really. Um, and then I do some uh, other things on the side, on top of that, for um, national institutions. I currently do a little bit of work for the British Board of Film Classification, which is um, on their uh, censoring. Mm. I, I've had the great pleasure of being at the cathedral many times now. And tell me, how old is the cathedral? Um, mm. And, and what kind of capacity it has and, you know, what kind of functions you hold there? Because you hold, of course, you know, it's there as, a, as, a, as, a, as an Anglican, uh, you know, place of worship, but you're also very open to our other faiths and we've had multi-faith uh, events. Mm. Um, so tell, tell us a bit about that. So the cathedral um, in its present structure is, um, uh, like a lot of cathedrals, it's, it's a little bit of a sort of hodgepodge of uh, dates. Some of it's medieval, um, some of it goes back a little bit earlier than that uh, in terms of foundations, but essentially it started to be a cathedral for the Diocese of Oxford in the mid 16th century, so the, the, you know, the, the mid 1500s. Uh, before that, it was, um, of course, an enormous uh, chapel in Cardinal College. And before that, it was an Augustinian priory. But it can trace its roots way, way back to Saxon times with uh, Frideswide, who's the patron saint of the city, and the diocese and the university, uh, really in the late 7th century, uh, setting up a community here uh, which offered prayer and worship and then it became a, an Augustinian priory uh, later after the Norman conquest. Now you can probably at a pinch shoehorn in maybe 750, 800 just over people into the cathedral if you want. Mm -hmm. um, that would be absolute capacity I think but um, in terms of what it offers well it's broad and inclusive so it's uh, kind of classic middle of the road Church of England. It's a place of inclusion and hospitality for everybody, whether they have some faith, no faith, another faith or none. Mm -hmm. And what we try and do is weave together these things because we are here for everybody and uh, mindful that many of the things that go on in cathedral, particularly ours, are civic, county, city, charity, university, collegiate. And the people we're drawing into this are actually celebrating and uh, remembering and praying through and commemorating and honoring the very best things in life uh, yeah. sacrifice charity service hospitality education i could go on but uh, but that's what we're doing thank you thank you and um at what point did you decide that you were going to dedicate your life and pursue a career in theology because I, I, I read theology as well and 
So I'd love to know when, when, when was that moment when you said, right, I'm going to be a theologian. Oh, wow. Well, that, that, that's a how long have you got question, I think. Um, <laughs> so I think the first thing to say is, is I don't think I decided that I wanted to do this. I, I had um, a rather sort of shocking, disturbing uh, call, vocation. Uh, when I was um, uh, 16 and I wanted to leave school. Nobody in my family had ever been to university. In fact, very few had even gone to, on to A-levels, actually. And I, I wanted to leave school. Um, but I felt this extraordinary, undeniable call to offer my life for ministry. I have to tell you, Manawa, I was furious um, because I, I couldn't imagine myself being uh, so conventional as to uh, join the church, let alone be um, somebody who was uh, doing something that was, you know, relatively speaking, um, uh, an officer of the church, a minister. <laughs> but after about two weeks of struggling with this, um, I did what I think people do in religion. I, I, I surrendered. Um, I realized I could not be myself unless I yielded and became this so I resolved to do A-levels. I, I hoped that that would get this all out of my system, and it didn't. Um, my hunger for theology and religious studies grew and grew and grew. So I went to university and read that. Um, I still hoped that this might sort of, you know, bleach out of me the call, but it didn't. I went to work in publishing and marketing and the media for five years. And it, it just got stronger and stronger. And in the end, I went to uh, a selection conference to see whether I, the call could be tested. And um, they came back and said, uh, yes, we'll take you. So my surrender terms were hopeless at that point. Um, so that's um, so basically I've been living with this call for um, 40 years. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah. It's 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 wonderful how these things work, isn't it? Because you have something within you that's calling you, mm. and yet your journey to it isn't straight. It has to go through other points, as it were. Yes. And, yes. and I, I found that you know I used to be a petrol retailer and you know a, a, a commodities trader, and but all mm. of those things that I've done in my life uh, have helped me to get to where I am. And they've given me on the way here, have given me the skills uh, t that enable me to to actually be effective in in what I do, uh, in in term you know in my role as, as an imam. Absolutely, no, um, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And you know we struggle with these things, don't we? But um, but uh, you know God is greater. Yeah, I mean for, for me it was I think the catalyst, the real big event was when my mother passed away, um, and that was the moment that I thought. Uh, you know, I just no long. I just you know, I grew up in that generation. I'm sure we're the same, uh, similar kind of age. Uh, um, the the age of loads of money, you know, mm. uh, the 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 age of everything being privatized, and the, uh, the sense that you know, uh, it, it was all about material gain, uh, and then suddenly the loss of my mother, um, just was was a catalyst to say you know all of those things about uh, making loads of money, accumulating loads of wealth and being successful in business and so on, didn't really count anymore for me. So, um, so in, in terms of, um, I mean, you've had a very highly successful career as a, uh, at the principal, as a principal of Ripon College. And in the light of formation of Christian leadership, I wonder what you would consider to be essential qualities of a faith leader in the 21st century. Uh, both in the context of Christian ministry, but also generally uh, as, as a faith leader uh, in, in the 21st century? Um, I think that, I mean, it's a wonderful question, isn't it? Um, so what drives and motivates me? Well, I think this is going to sound very cheesy on one level, but um, I think it's integrity, it's goodness, it's truthfulness, um, it's sharing, it's charity. Um, and sometimes that's uh, most of those things are generative they're positive so you can promote those things when they come up against resistance sometimes I, I, I find that as I've got older um, I'm more of a kind of um, 
how can I put it? I found more resistance in myself than I thought I knew I had really. So uh, I hate injustice. Um, I hate untruthfulness. I hate it when people are not good. Um, I hate hate actually. <laughs> and so I think one of the things I really want uh, that drives me in my ministry and in my work day to day is uh, the importance of kindness and goodness. I remember being interviewed many years ago now by uh, a student at uh, Ripon College, Cudston, where I was uh, looking after the, uh, the vicar factory, as I sometimes put it, uh, the place where train people for ordination. And uh, the interviewer said to him, so what are you trying to do here with these people? And you could give lots of theological answers about getting people formed liturgically and more theology pumped into their brains. And I said, well, you know, I think I'm trying to take good people and make them even more good. Because at the end of the day, clergy, I mean, they can be bad preachers. I can live with that. Uh, they can be disorganized. I can live with that. But I can't live with clergy who are not good. And by good, I don't mean performatively. I mean good in the sense of virtue. So good people, trustworthy, reliable, honest, decent, kind, gentle, good. Mm. So what drives me is um, being part of an institution, uh, making that possible in the institution because the institutions will radiate that goodness out into the wider world. It is, I think, all about goodness. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, now, the impact of the uh, current COVID-19 virus has been profound on our lives. Will it result in lasting change and what might that change be? I think it will. I, I think we, we've not experienced this uh, social distancing before, um, which is very counterintuitive for us as human beings. We're drawn to each other. We are, we are social creatures, social animals. Um, and keeping our distance is, is unnatural. So we are finding new ways of relating. We're finding that um, thanks to uh, social media and the internet, people are able to do extraordinary community things and take social action and be neighborly. That's great. Um, I think we're beginning to see the limits of what the state and the government can do and the power of local communities and neighborhood networks and other groups and what they can do. Um, so I think those things are, are, are good. Uh, I mean, those, those are good outcomes, I think, from this, really. I think we're also beginning to discover as well what is essential and what is peripheral. And that's another, I think, real watershed for many people in this. What, what actually matters? What, you know, what is an essential journey, actually, when all's said and done? And uh, what is my responsibility to my neighbour in, in all of this? So I think there's a process of real rediscovery going on about how we are obliged towards our, our uh, colleagues, our neighbours, our fellow citizens. Uh, a word that we don't use very much, you hear the Queen using it uh, a little bit more, and it's a, it's, it's a word that's sort of gone out of fashion in our generation. But the word, the word is duty. Um, what do I have to do? What should I do, whether I feel like it or not? Mm. And I, again, used to say to uh, students at Cudston training for ordination, there's a line in one of the prayers over the bread and the wine that talks about this being a duty and a joy. It's not just a joy, it's a duty. So you have to do this and many, many other things in ministry because we ask you to, and it's not an opt-out. Now, I think we are going to rediscover what our duties as citizens are in all of this. What do we owe each other? because we are human beings and because we're fellow citizens, not because we like people or because we've got spare time on our hands. What do we owe as a result of being human beings to fellow human beings? It's potentially incredibly helpful and liberating, I think. Mm. No, thank you for that. 
Martin. Um, in terms of being a person of faith and the unprecedented time that we're going through, what kind of resource does faith give us hope in such difficult times? Hmm. And maybe a personal reflection on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the most important things, um, I think, and I think this applies to all faiths, is uh, hope. Um, it's, it's not just optimism, that's a different thing. Mm. Uh, hope. Um, hope in humanity, hope in something better, hope in the possibility of finding something beyond this that is going to be richer, broader, um, better, more good, more charitable, more generous, than we've previously known before. So I think one of the things that faith does is it gives us uh, faith and hope and love. It, it binds these things together. And uh, although that's a particularly Christian way of uh, putting those things together, I do think it's common to all faiths. So one of the things I believe that unites faiths across the world is the possibility of a better world and of the hope that we have in God to help us all make that. Uh, and I think that's not just a resource, that's something that's a powerful generator at the base of our faith lives and our prayer lives. Our um, virtual prayer service yesterday was, uh, the theme was hope. Mm. And, um, and so we had prayers from different faiths uh, on that. Absolutely. Uh, Mm. And, and, and one of the terms that I came across was that this shall come to pass. Yes. You know, I mean, there's, there's such profound hope just in, in, in that uh, sentence and phrase. So uh, finally, Martin, at this very difficult time, what would your message be to the communities of Oxfordshire? Keep hoping, um, keep your eyes and ears open for what is around you. See what you can do to help other people in need. Very difficult thing to do at the moment when people are effectively locked down, but um, make your senses keen and uh, be alert to what your conscience is saying to you. I think too, remember all those who have duties at this time. Um, health workers, key workers, uh, ministers of religion who will have to do things whether they think they can or not. They have to find the inner strength for them. Give them your support and your encouragement. Um, clap them, affirm them, do whatever you can. Remember that this will pass. And I think remember too that one of the things that comes out of this is uh, what remembering can mean. Uh, remember is sometimes just recollection. But sometimes if you break the word up, it is remembering. It's putting things back together that have been teased apart and they really belong together. And I think duty and civic life and hope and charity and neighborliness and faith needs to be remembered, put back together again. And I think uh, interfaith networks, uh, our local communities, our neighborhoods watching over each other uh, in a caring way that looks after those who are vulnerable and isolated is one of my great hopes in this, that we will come out of this better, stronger, more in touch with our humanity, and more in touch with the faith that keeps us going day in, day out. Well, Martin, thank you so much for those wonderful, kind words, for making time in your very busy uh, diary for us. Uh, bless you and take care of yourself and keep well. It's a pleasure, Manawa. Thank you very much for your questions and, um, and, and all, all power and strength and hope and encouragement to you and to all who are tuned in. Thank you.